Hey guys, Jesse with Camp Perspective here, and uh, I'm joined by my pity Lexi. <clears throat> um, so finally getting around to do that, uh, this uh, what to expect when you're expecting uh, and you have a dog video. This has been on the to-do list, I feel like, for like a couple of years. Um, so now that I have some time and, uh, you know, we had a, a client who recently had a baby, baby Tobias. Uh, so congratulations, guys, on the baby. Um, we had a couple other clients recently also have a baby. So uh, there's a lot of questions, especially like if we have dogs that have behavioral issues. Um, so in this video, as I was doing my research, and thank you uh, for those that submitted questions, um, you know, and I was going back to my emails from like previous clients and stuff like that throughout the years that has sent me questions, is I'm going to make this video like a general uh, baby video. But then uh, I figured, you know, trying to cover everything was going to be such a, a long video is I'm going to do this general video, but then I'm going to go back and just kind of uh, questions that I've gotten throughout the years, you know, cases that I've worked with throughout the years, uh, you know, explaining how we work through things and the particular issues that that, you know, family may have had, stuff like that. And just make you and, and make more of a series as opposed to just like a one off video. I think that's going to be more beneficial. Um, and then, uh, you know, feel free uh, to continue to submit questions either by commenting on this video. Uh, you can email us at info at canineperspective.com, uh, you know, or comment on our Instagram or what have you. Um, uh, the, the, most likely not going to communicate directly with you, uh, but I will take the question and then just, you know, do a video when I have time uh, and then add it to the playlist, okay? Because uh, we do get people asking questions, just general training questions and stuff, and they're not clients, and uh, it's it's I can't answer everybody. I'm just one person. Okay, so these videos are meant to like help a broader range of 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 people because um, the most of the questions that I get surrounding a dog and a baby during pregnancy or post pregnancy um, are the same. So every now and then there might be the kind of a special case where it's like, okay, you know, the, this is very particular, but it may be beneficial to, um, to other people. It's just not as common. Okay. So, uh, I've actually taken notes, uh, which I typically don't do. I usually just kind of riff off the top. Uh, but I want this to be a little bit more structured. So I'm going to start first, um, with I think here, the, the, the kind of structured approach that I have, and then I'm gonna end with a few questions that we got via Instagram or email. Uh, most of the stuff that was asked, again, were common questions or related questions, uh, but I'll try to be more specific to that particular person. Uh, so to get started, if you're planning, you know, to, to have a baby or, you know, to get pregnant and all that, and you have a dog, especially a dog with behavioral issues, you wanna start your training then. One of the Biggest uh, issues that I come across is clients are seven months into the uh, to the pregnancy and it's like, all oh, our dog is driving us crazy. We need to get this done now. And one, uh, you know, we're short, technically we're short a handler because at that point at seven months, you know, the, the baby's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, you're fairly pregnant at that point, right? So um, can't walk that, that long. Uh, can't stand for that long. Also, we don't want the dog pulling, uh, uh, you know, the woman down, uh, potentially uh, causing it to potentially fall on her stomach or anything like that. It's, it's, it's dangerous, especially if we're dealing with a reactive large breed dog. So now it's really just the dad undertaking everything, okay? Um, which is fine, and it's going to be a part of the process for a bit. But <clears throat> if you start the training when you're planning on having the baby, you're already miles ahead, okay? Um, also, let's say you're using a training approach that isn't um, working, it isn't effective, it's not getting you what you're looking for, you have time to stop the training and find another trainer, okay, which may happen. Um, so when you're waiting to the very end and you find a trainer and maybe they're not a very good trainer, maybe the methods aren't going to work well for your particular case, you know, what have you, you don't really have much time to dilly-dally. So you want to start that process immediately, okay? Um, me personally, I don't care how you train your dog. I just care that you do train your dog and that you're uh, cognizant and aware of the limitations that each training method has, 
Okay, so if you have a dog that has aggression issues and you're really insistent on, I'm gonna use positive only to fix this problem, good luck. Okay, I wish the best of luck to you. Uh, if it's legitimately aggression or a legitimate behavior case, in my experience uh, throughout the years, and this is 12 years of training dogs, uh, not gonna work, okay? But if that's what you wanna do, it's your dog, it's your life, um, but do be aware of the limitations and then be um, realistic with them. So, cause if you're bringing a child in and you happen to have a dog that doesn't like kids and it's an, a legitimate behavior of like, I don't like kids, like that, that's a, that is a dicey situation you're gonna put yourself in, okay? So beginning training immediately, okay? Don't wait till, till uh, you're seven months into a nine month pregnancy or anything like that, okay? Um, once uh, uh, you're pregnant, don't be surprised if you see a behavioral shift, okay? So uh, an example is I did a consultation a few years, uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, it was some kind of golden retriever retriever breed, completely social, completely friendly, uh, no issues. And then the wife got pregnant and they actually didn't know, uh, but the dog started acting weird. Um, uh, as they start, dogs are showing signs of separation anxiety. Uh, and also beginning to show uh, signs of reactivity, okay? And then, you know, she, she had missed her, her menstrual cycle, took a test, and then realized they were pregnant. And um, it tied together uh, with the same time the behaviors started to crop up with their dog, okay? And it's crazy, right? That a dog is that sensitive, is that um, aware of things like that. Um, and, you know, because people ask, like, well, how does the dog know? changes in hormones like dogs have very strong senses of smell that they can actually smell like hormone levels and stuff like that from from what I've read um, so you know they did the consultation um, they were like I think three months and they're trying to find a, three months into at that point the pregnancy uh, they're trying to find a trainer uh, the dog's behavior was starting to escalate and uh, you know I was talking to them e-collar blah, blah 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 they never moved forward with the training so I don't know what happened with that case um, cause they were, they were pretty anti aversives and I just told them, you know, bluntly, I said, you know, your dog has already developed separation anxiety. Uh, it happened essentially immediately once he got pregnant. Now the dog started to show, started to show signs of uh, reactivity, which started to escalate over time. I think at first it started with dogs and then it started to go towards people. And I also believe at that point, the dog started showing territorial behavior towards people entering the home. Um, uh, which was the cause of them reaching out to like a trainer like myself that used the versives. So, you know, things started to escalate. I don't know what happened. You know, we did the consult, they never moved forward. So I wish, I hope things went well. Okay. So, um, uh, the reasoning behind it, um, uh, you know, dogs have pretty good instincts. Uh, you know, they may be, they may be aware that like, uh, there's a new, uh, being in this world, uh, you know, like, uh, when um, a dog or a female dog has babies, you know, they can be territorial over the bait or the puppies, uh, even towards the owner, you know, uh, every now and then you get dogs that aren't and they trust the owner and so on and so forth. But I remember when I was a kid growing up, uh, my neighbor had two chows and they had puppies. And uh, when, the, when the female had her litter and the, her, uh, my friend's dad went to go in to like check on the puppies, like she bit him on the hand and you know, it was over the puppies. I think they were probably like within the first week of being born and he couldn't go into the um, dog house. He would just go out there and drop, you know, kibble for her or whatever and then leave because she, he couldn't go into the, into the, um, uh, into the dog house where the puppies were. So uh, they have really good instincts. So um, they're aware of that stuff kind of sooner than we are. And then uh, dogs are instinctual creatures. So because in my opinion, they can sense that there is another being uh, and it's a, a weaker being, right? It can't defend itself. Their territorial, their protective instincts start to kick in, okay? So uh, watching for changes in behavior. Uh, in that case, uh, signs of separation anxiety and then uh, reactivity started to escalate over the course of time. Um, <clears throat> so if you, even if your dog is completely social and stuff, I've seen all type, these, these uh, cases work all sorts of different ways where even like in this case, a so completely social dog a dog that you would not expect, like a, a retriever type dog, a Labrador golden retriever type dog, uh, displaying these kind of defensive behaviors, okay? So just keeping an eye on that stuff. If your dog already has 
uh, a tendency towards these behaviors, an escalation of potentially, okay? And it doesn't mean that it will. Um, there's no concrete, there is no guarantee that these things will play out the way that they're gonna play out. Uh, it's just things to look out for, okay? So we're looking for changes in behavior. Uh, is the dog more territorial, either over you? Uh, sometimes the dogs become more territorial over the, 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 you know, the wife, uh, uh, the woman who's pregnant, um, or they become territorial over the home. Uh, or territorial uh, outside if anybody's passing by with reactivity, uh, anxiety, nervousness, stuff like that, okay? Uh, begin training immediately. You know, don't wait for the last minute again. Uh, this way, if your training isn't working, you have time to find a new trainer or find an approach that may work better for you. Uh, in my opinion, uh, aversives are a good part and a necessary part to training. Positive reinforcement is great. We use positive reinforcement. All our puppies under six months, all our puppy Head Start puppies, uh, positive reinforcement. But I always tell everybody, this is kindergarten stuff. This is not lifelong. This is not substantial. This is just setting the foundation. At six months, we start the big boy, big girl training. We do remote collars, so on and so forth. We apply the aversives, and we want to build reliable uh, obedience, OK? Um, if your dog already has behavior issues, like don't worry, in the sense of people get really tied up with, my dog is reactive. I don't want my dog to like bite my kid one day, OK? Because those are like kind of two separate things. Um, even if your dog is reactive, uh, one, if it's towards dogs, uh, the dog, the chance of your dog going after your child in relation to that is minimal, unless the dog redirects and your child happens to be towards, uh, next to your, your, your dog when they're being reactive in that moment, then I can see the dog redirecting to your child. But people can get to get really worked up in the sense of, oh, my dog shows aggressive behaviors towards dogs and I don't want them to, you know, show that towards my kid. I go, those are two separate things. Okay. Now, if your dog already has a tendency to be nervous around children, unsure about children, even defensive around children, I still tell people not to worry because those are two different contexts, okay? So if we already have a dog that is naturally inclined um, uh, to be nervous around children or unsure about children, so for example, Lexi, Lexi's not been around a lot of kids her, in her life, and she's currently 13 years old, okay? So she is a bit unsure in the beginning until she gets used to them, and then she's like, okay, you know, you're a kid. Um, if I let that child invade her space and or be, you know, like a kid, erratic around her, she becomes uncomfortable. I step in to tell the child, you need to give my dog space, okay? Um, now, <clears throat> because that is um, not the norm for her, Okay, having a kid with that kind of energy being around, that's not the norm, so she's unsure about it. Uh, if I do not set boundaries with the child, she will do it, okay? So she might nip the child, growl, show teeth, uh, to tell them, you need to give me space because I don't like your energy. That is perfectly okay in their world. However, in our world, it doesn't transfer well because we're going, oh, the dog's being aggressive and it's just a kid, they don't know what they're doing, but the dog doesn't know that, okay? So um, when it comes to those kinds of cases, I tell people, don't worry, because that child is not the kid's norm, right? So when you bring home your baby, I'm not worried about, uh, you know, if the dog is growling because they're unsure, they're like, what is this energy, so on and so forth, uh, because we have time to coexist and by the time the child, you know, is a toddler, walking around, can take some direction, like be gentle, so on and so forth, enough time has passed that the dog thinks, oh, you've been here for two to three years. Like, you're just another member of the family now, okay? So I've even had some very severe aggression cases where, you know, I was worried, and the dog loves the kid. Never an issue with the kid, okay? Uh, so, and I've had other cases where the dog's completely social and then has issues with the kid. It, it can go any way, but the best approach to, to helping a dog that's unsure around children is just simply coexistence over time. So because obviously the baby's going to be around 24-7, day after day, month after month, year after year, at some point, more often than not, the dog becomes comfortable with the child. Okay, but boundaries are always very important here. Um, some things to do during the pregnancy as well is um, start introducing things like the stroller. It sounds silly, but I'll tell my clients, like, start walking your dog with the stroller. Because one, um, 
if the dog is scared of the stroller, you want to work past that stuff when the stroller is empty. So if the dog freaks out and knocks it down, no big deal. Uh, two, you want to get used to walking your dog with the stroller as a handler, like handler skills, mechanics, turning, movement, stuff like that. Um, uh, again, when we're not under stress and like the baby, and you're not, uh, how do you say, operating in two hours of sleep, you're, like you're doing all this stuff prior. Uh, introducing things like uh, the baby carrier, the walker, if you already happen to have one, uh, toys, and setting boundaries with all these things, okay? So uh, if we bring out the baby walker and the dog is being avoided and moving away, like that's completely normal. It's actually healthy in my opinion. If the dog were to growl and attack it, obviously we know, okay, great, we found that out now because we need to correct that behavior and figure out what to do in the future, okay? So by introducing the dog to these things, you're um, uh, putting yourself ahead of the game in the sense of if the dog is defensive towards these objects, you have time to correct and address them and or you have time to plan around like what are we gonna do if you're not using aversives, for example, if you're like doing PR plus or positive reinforcement, uh, if the dog keeps attacking the kennel and you don't know what to, uh, uh, how do you say, you don't, you're, you're, the methods that you're using are not addressing the behavior, then I go, okay, well, now we know we have to kennel the dog anytime the stroller is going to be out or, any, or anytime the walker is going to be out or we got to put the dog in a separate room, close the door when the, the baby's going to be in the walker. Like you already know these things as opposed to let's put the baby in the walker, baby starts to walk and then the dog goes for the walker while the baby is in there. Okay. So um, ex exposing the dog to all these, things, all these things prior to when the child is around is ideal. Okay. Um, muzzle conditioning. Uh, you know, either during or, you know, or, or when you're planning the pregnancy, starting that process. Uh, if you know your dog already has a tendency to be uh, apprehensive around kids and stuff like that, you want to be one step ahead, already have the muzzle condition. Uh, you know, we suggest the Baskerville style muzzle. It's, the, it's a basket style, or not Baskerville style, it's a Baskerville brand muzzle. Uh, we use it here all the time. It's meant for extended wear. The dog can open their mouth and pant normally. They can drink water, they can take treats, they can eat food, all that stuff. Uh, and it's meant for extended wear. So that this way we have a buffer as well. Uh, I've even had clients whose dogs didn't show any signs of like defensiveness with kids, but they do it anyways, because they think it's just safe to have that option in case that problem would, were to, uh, to crop up, which is very wise, um, because uh, you on, honestly don't know when or will, or when, when or uh, where there will be an issue and when it'll crop up or anything like that, okay? So now, uh, moving on, uh, boundaries. Some common things that I've come across where boundaries are important are the baby scent. So this kind of ties into introducing the dog to the baby in the sense of um, when uh, you might read like, oh, bring home a, a baby towel or a, a blanket, you know, the baby's clothes to start introducing the scent to the home, which I agree with. But where I disagree is if I set the blanket onto uh, the couch or whatever, and the dog goes to smell it, most people just let the dog smell it and get really close, okay? Like right here, or even just touching or maybe licking it and stuff. I don't do that. I don't suggest doing that. Um, I would set a boundary. And if we're doing remote collar, I do very low level, and I start to remote the dog when they get too close to the scent, okay? So I might set a four to six foot boundary. When we're dealing with dogs that have defensiveness around around children, I actually do at minimum, minimum is six feet. I would rather do eight to 10 feet boundary, okay? So the dog can smell from a distance. The dog does not need to be immediately next to the object in order to catch the scent. Um, uh, so we can do a greater distance and the dog can still catch the scent, but what they're, what they're relating to it is, um, when I come across the scent, I wanna be at a distance of it, okay? Uh, showing respect to that scent, it's not gonna make the dog not like the baby. The dog just thinks when I get too close to that scent, a correction happens, but when I give that scent space, nothing happens, okay? Um, the reason why I do this is I have had it happen to people or clients where the baby was like in the um, carrier, uh, the dog was smelling the baby, and this is like, you know, weak old baby type of stuff and got really close and started growling and then nipped the baby, okay? Um, and you might think like, well, Jesse, if the dog came into the baby's space, why would it growl and just nip at them? 
and I and in my theory is well because the dog is unsure. So the dog goes and uh, goes up to the baby, and goes, "Who are you?" They're smelling, right? The baby's not doing anything. They might be moving a little bit. The dog's like, "Who are you?" They're like, "This is this is new. This is strange. I've not come across this before." So then they growl. They become unsure and they nip at it uh, as like a getaway, right? But obviously it's a baby. It's immobile. Baby doesn't know, uh, but the dog doesn't know that, right? So by when we're proactive about setting these boundaries, we're not putting ourselves in this position where the dog is too close and then something happens, okay? And I do this with, uh, so when we bring anything home with the baby scent, I'm using my collar at a low level that anytime they get too close, I'm tapping, I'm not cueing anything. I'm not saying no, I'm just tapping until the dog backs away and gives space. And then you'll see the dog still sniffing, but they're six feet away, okay? So then the dog goes, okay, when I come across a scent, I wanna give it space. Uh, we do this with the blanket, the clothes, stroller, you know, baby bottle, like anything that would have the baby scent, uh, we wanna teach them to give space, okay? Um, the other thing is like, a, a, you know, toys on the floor and stuff like that, dogs can learn the difference between their toys and the baby's toys because the baby's toys would have, again, their scent on it. So that's also a reason why for setting the boundaries so the dog will learn in time to ignore the baby's toys and only uh, uh, interact with their own, uh, which leads me to the point of I never leave stuff on the ground because of resource guarding. Okay, so if you free feed your dog, you gotta stop that, put that bowl up after five minutes. If you leave your dog's toys laying around all the time, you gotta stop that, put your dog's toys away. Also your baby's toys, once they're done, put that stuff away, okay? Because if we fast forward and the baby is crawling, the dog is chewing on a bone, uh, baby gets too close, we might get an interaction there, a negative interaction. Uh, if the dog is free fed and the baby's crawling around in the kitchen and they get too close to the bowl, we might have an interaction there. Okay, so it's a lot of avoidance and just boundaries. Um, tummy time. So uh, tummy time from my understanding is, you know, when you're on the ground with the baby and, and, and spending time with them and stuff like that, right? Um, is if you lay down, I'm sure you're you probably experienced this, your dog will most likely come running to you and they're licking on you and they're like all excited and stuff, right? You don't want that happening when you got a baby on the floor. So what I tell my clients to do is start getting used to laying on the ground and when the dog runs over, again, setting that boundary with the remote and correcting them to tell them, to, to teach them to stay away. The alternative option is to place your dog. So like currently uh, Lexi is in place. Um, so I place my dog in the corner of the room and I've already done the work I know my dog's not gonna move, just like Lexi hasn't moved for the past, what, like 10 to 15 minutes. My dog's not gonna move because I've, I've spent the time during the planning phase and the pregnancy to make sure my training was solid and I know my dog's reliable, okay? So when I lay down to do tummy time with the baby, that dog's not gonna move. I don't have to worry about the dog running over. Your dog might be friendly, but you need to understand that if you have an infant or a, 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 a child on the floor, your dog might step on them, okay? The other day, I was in the kitchen, Lexi ran over, <laughs> she was excited, and she stepped on my foot. And it hurt because she's got nails, she's a sizable dog, she's 60 pounds, right? So it's the same thing for the baby. The dog ran over and dig their nails into them. They're not intending to do that hurtfully, but they're doing it because they're dogs and they see you on the ground and they get excited and they're just, you know, all over the place. And they might jump on the baby, might harm the baby. Uh, so boundaries, either teach your dog when we're on the ground, this has nothing to do with you and or use your place command to teach the dog, you're gonna be there, you're not gonna move, okay? And again, <clears throat> training sessions. If you've already done the work of place and everything, great, now, before the baby's around, place your dog, lay on the ground. Does your dog run over to you? If they do, correct the dog, lead them back, keep repeating, if the dog keeps breaking, raise your level, okay? Until you find a number that teaches the dog, when I tell you to place, you don't wanna break it no matter what I'm doing, okay? Uh, putting boundaries with um, the nursery room. So like I've had people who bring like dog beds, dog beds into the nursery room and stuff like that. And I suggest not, again, you want the dog to respect the scent. So the issue with bringing a dog into the nursing room, uh, one is dander. Um, I, I, I believe um, uh, with our very young babies and stuff like dog dandruff or, or the dander or the hair or the fur and stuff, not good for them. So that's one reason. Um, Two, I have come across cases where the dog becomes attached to the baby and will protect the baby from the parents, okay? Because the parents allow the dog to always be in the room and then when they would come to enter, the dog would start growling at them, okay? I've also had dogs protect the parents from the baby. 
I've had the dogs, I've had dogs protect the baby and the parents from everybody else, right? Um, I've had the uh, dogs protect the baby and the, the, the mother from the father. You know, I, I've seen all sorts of things. Again, there's no guarantee on how this is gonna play out. These are just kind of experiences to let you know anything could happen. So, but if you allow your dog a ton of time with your baby, potentially the dog uh, starts to see their baby kind of as their own puppy and then starts to protect the baby from you, okay? So the nursery is the baby space. Uh, I don't like when we allow the dog to sleep outside. Like if this is the threshold of the door and the dog is sleeping here, I'm not a fan of that because it's technically, if they're in front of the door, they can also guard the door. I want space. I want, if I'm in the nursing room and there's a hallway, it's the living room. My dog is in the living room minding their business. You could also use place command or you just teach your dog, you cannot enter the boundary, enter the, the nursery. You will be corrected. I don't want you in the hallway. You will be corrected. And the dog goes, okay, well, I'll just exist in the living, in the living room. Perfectly fine. Okay. Um, so boundaries uh, around any of the baby's things, um, the carrier, nursery room, crib, wa uh, the walker, you know, toys, just, just boundaries, 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 and boundaries, in my opinion, reinforce through physical consequence. In this case, we use remote collar. If you use prong collar, stuff like that, like, like that. But, you know, if your dog is already here and you're trying to correct them, this is already, in my opinion, too late. Okay. Uh, next thing is introduction. Uh, I covered a little bit, like bringing home a blanket, you know, the scent, start uh, getting the dog used to having the scent around the house. So once the baby is, is, is uh, brought into the world, you know, if there's time um, to bring something home, uh, you can do so. Uh, usually, from what I've heard, it's very hectic and it's difficult for that to happen. So don't worry if you can't. Uh, in my, if you've done remote collar, you have a grayer, you have a bigger area, a gray area than if you didn't. And I don't like using the word gray area. You know, I'm very black and white about things with both my dog training and just, you know, how I run my business and stuff like that. Uh, but there is gray area in the sense of, oh, I don't have time to bring home my baby's blanket to introduce the scent to my dog and set boundaries prior. But if I come home, I walk in first, I collar up my dog, I bring in the baby, the dog runs over, I'm already tapping the dog and addressing it in the moment, okay? So, but ideally, you wanna address all these things prior. Um, again, my, uh, I prefer a distance of at minimum, you know, four to six feet for the social dogs, uh, six feet plus for the dogs that aren't very, uh, well-behaved around children. Um, coexistence is all I care about in the beginning. Uh, so like when we did the Instagram post, uh, it's like some kind of doodle dog and then the baby's like sleeping on the dog. And at, I put PS, I don't suggest taking pictures like this. And I feel uh, because of social media, like that's a big thing, right? Oh, I want the cute picture of my baby and my dog or what have you. And uh, it's my suggestion that you don't push things like that because let's say the child's resting on the dog and there is no issue, but then the child were to grab a, a, a thing, a tuft of fur and just pull because they don't have mechanics and the dog goes, look, and they nip the baby to correct them, to teach them like, hey, don't do that because uh, that's what they would do to their puppies. That is uh, not aggression, that is a correction. But again, the humans freak out because like, oh my God, my dog bit my baby. And I go, no, your dog corrected your baby because you were being an irresponsible pet par uh, parent and pet parent by putting your dog in that position because you assumed your dog would be fine, okay? So just because you've never seen your dog become defensive or aggressive does not mean your dog cannot become defensive or aggressive. It's just you've not seen the dog put in a context in which they felt they need to behave that way, okay? So um, I'm always just focused on coexistence, going back to what I mentioned earlier. Even in the cases where dogs are apprehensive of children, uh, nervous around children, maybe not even like children, when they see them day in and day out, day and night, you know, for hours at a time, it gives them time to observe and kind of process like you're just another member of the family. And in time, they may themselves come to introduce themselves to the baby in the sense of like um, smelling, uh, maybe even a little bit of affection like licking and stuff. But again, this is, I don't recommend 
allowing this until the child is, you know, understanding things like gentle and be nice and, and soft and slow, right? These like kind of real simple concepts. Um, because um, if you introduce too soon, even if things are going well, it doesn't mean that things can't go wrong, okay? So I'm very cautious. Just because we're dealing with kids and a negative experience with the dog can be very traumatic for a child. Uh, for example, I remember, I think I was at the uh, at Oz Park and there was like a little family get together and there was like a little toddler. He was probably like two to three, three to four years old, you know, running around. And uh, there was a, somebody brought their puppy and it was like a golden retriever puppy. And it was eight months, it was, you know, two month old puppy or whatever, not eight months, eight weeks. Um, started chasing the kid and the kid started screaming and everybody started laughing, but I could recognize that the, that the child was in, in, was in clear distress, even though the puppy was literally just a two month old puppy who was, you know, overly friendly. But then because the child started screaming, turned on prey drive, yes, puppies that young have prey drive. And then the puppy started nipping and then like biting at their pants and shorts and stuff like that. Um, and the kids started freaking out even more. Okay. So that, obviously I don't know what happened going after that, but after that, who knows what happened with the child psychologically with, with, with dogs. Okay. So, um, it is our responsibility as the adults and as the ones that know better to set boundaries, both with the puppy or the dog towards the child, but with the dog also towards the puppy or the dog. Okay. So with coexistence, uh, what this looks like is, let's say, you know, we're doing tummy time. My dog's in place. My dog is still within the social context. Uh, they're, they're still there experiencing. They're still there witnessing this interaction between me and the child. And the dog sees that. And they go like, okay, like, I may not be comfortable with that child, but clearly they have something to do with you because you're interacting with them, right? Then the child starts to crawl. Um, not uncommon at this stage that dogs start to growl. So... Um, you know, again, place, if you have a very solid place, growling doesn't mean aggression. Growling just means I'm unsure. Uh, could it predict aggression? Yes, but it, not always. So um, if we have, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not too certain or sure about like, if my dog is gonna hold the position uh, or, or like you're concerned with the level of defensiveness your dog has, kennel your dog, okay? Put your dog in the kennel. They can still be in the room. Now, if they're showing excessive defensiveness in the kennel, excessive growling, barking, you know, stuff like that, then you really need to fix that problem, okay? Because that's escalating. If it stays static or continues, definitely need to address that problem. But uh, potentially the barrier of the kennel can cause things to become a little bit more heightened because the dog is contained. Um, they don't have an out, so to speak. Um, but if they're, if they're able to, to observe and uh, kind of experience the discomfort but also realize like nothing bad's gonna happen, that's a part of co coexistence, okay? So um, once the child understands the concept of the gentle and stuff and you feel like your dog is much more comfortable, they're, they're, you can tell by the behavior, the way they walk around, they're not so avoidant, things like that. Uh, and your dog shows that they're wanting to interact, you know, they can start coming in and stuff, but always when you're present, always under supervision, uh, a flat rule is dogs and kids are never left unattended, okay? I don't care if you have the friendliest, loviest dog in the world. Children and dogs are never left unattended with each other because that's when things happen, okay? And it's your fault as a parent uh, for, for doing so uh, if something happens, okay? So um, you can also pair in uh, positive reinforcement. So like, uh, you know, if, if you're doing tummy time and stuff like that and your dog is doing really well and you want to give them a little treat, kind of tie in like, you know, good things happen when you're there and you're observing and stuff like that, you feel free to do so. When we do positive reinforcement, uh, we use very high value things, cheese, turkey, bologna, hot dog, sausage, pepperoni. I want the good stuff. I want the dog to go, wow, whenever I see that baby, I get the greatest stuff in the world. But when I don't see the baby, it's just regular old kibble and that's it. Okay. So really taking advantage of situations like that. One thing that um, I do allow, okay, and this is uh, based upon your judgment, If we, I would not recommend this if your dog is a resource guarder, is when the baby is in the high chair eating later on and they're dropping food on the floor, uh, dogs will begin to scavenge. And if your dog is not a resource guarder, 
I actually tell my parents, uh, I've actually told, you know, my clients, like, you can allow that to happen because that's positive reinforcement, right? So the dog goes, hey, when that baby's in that high chair, I find stuff on the ground. I get snacks, right? And now the dog starts to see the baby as a, as a, as a positive because they're like, wow, like when you're eating, I like you drop stuff on the floor and I, I get freebies, right? Uh, but if your dog is a resource guarder, I do not recommend this. I would then put your dog away, kennel them, place them, separate them when, you're, when your child is eating. Make sure you clean up the floor well um, so that we avoid any uh, potential uh, guarding behavior when they're scavenging, okay? So, uh, but yeah, that's something that I, I allowed to happen. Pending the dog looks like they're becoming more comfortable. They're not so nervous. They're not so growly, so on and so forth. Uh, it's a great thing. That's a great thing to allow. We can always set boundaries later on, right? Because then we don't want the dog to think they can just like take food out the baby's hand when they're walking around and stuff like that. It's more contextual uh, uh, and not just a free for all. Anytime the baby or the child is walking with food, you can just take it from them because I've also had that happen. And I don't be that we don't want to, to allow. Okay. Um, what to expect? One, as I mentioned earlier, growling when the baby begins crawling uh, is super common. So there's either going to be growling when you bring the child home. G growling doesn't always mean aggression. Growling means I'm unsure about how I f I'm unsure about how I feel about this. Okay, with how I feel about this, um, especially if they've never been around children, if they've never been around chil uh, babies or children, not uncommon. Okay. Uh, I've even had this happen with social dogs. Again, they're just going like, what's going on here? What is this thing? Uh, when the baby starts to crawl, super common as well, because the dog gets used to the baby being immobile. They're not moving. And then one day the baby starts to move and the dog goes, what the hell is going on? Uh, then the dog gets used to the baby crawling and then the baby starts to start, uh, starts to walk. That's also the dog starts to growl. Okay. So once the baby is, or the child is, um, Kind of walking more confidently they can hold their balance and stuff in time the dogs are like okay like all right things are normal now okay uh you have to remember that dogs mature very quickly right at two months you go and you pick up your puppy and your puppy's already running around they can follow sense they have prey drive right they have play drive uh uh you know they 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 bark they whine uh they demand things right all that stuff they can already be potty trained uh Dogs mature very quickly, whereas humans mature very slowly, okay? So usually around that two to three year mark, the, the child's already walking well. Um, they can uh, start to take some level of direction, uh, things like that. So that's why I usually recommend waiting until later to do these kind of introductions, okay? So yes, growling, not uncommon. Um, barking or becoming reactive when the baby starts to cry. Uh, it can be for a couple of reasons. I've had dogs bark when the baby cried to alert the owners. I've had dogs become reactive because they didn't like the crying. Okay. Again, every case is different. This is stuff that you're just trying to feel out, which is why it's so important to get your training in prior. And in my book, remote collar training, because then if it's a behavior I don't want, like I don't want the dog one barking to wake up the baby. I have a means of stopping the behavior with my tool um, because I did all the training proactively in ahead of time. Um, increased territorial behavior. As I mentioned before, uh, you know, I've had dogs become territorial of the baby toward the parents, uh, of the parents towards the baby. Uh, they'll favor one parent in the baby. Uh, they'll, they'll become territorial over the family and be, uh, anything externally. You know, it can work any number of ways. Um, so that's not uncommon. Uh, that would most likely need to be addressed through training if, uh, um, if you start to see stuff like that. Um, me think here um, if you see uh, the dog moving away from your baby uh, that's already the dog showing apprehension or nervousness uh, definitely want to be very careful with what we allow with those interactions because if the, if the baby keeps pressing that dog's boundary and they can't get away they might escalate okay and correct the baby so dogs which I would categorize as another what to expect they correct their puppies very, very young. At three to four weeks, they're correcting their puppies already. Okay, if you go on YouTube, there's a video. I'm sure if you, if you YouTube like uh, 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 mother dog uh, calms her puppies or corrects her puppies, there's one of, a, of like a bunch of puppies in a room being puppies and the mother, it's like a golden retriever too, which is nice, comes in and starts growling. I think she even nips a couple of times, air nips, and the puppies are yelping and then they all settle down and calm down. That's what dogs do. 
and your baby is essentially a puppy to that dog. So if your if your baby gets out of line, your dog's gonna just like we correct our puppies. This is what we're gonna do, and then nips the child, and that's not aggression. That's a correction, and that's on you as a parent for allowing that to happen. Okay. So these are like the most common things that I come across, um, and how I, I would go about approaching them, and what I recommend. So now I'm gonna move. Um, to answering some questions that we got. Some of them already pertain to things that, I, that I've already covered. Uh, excuse me if I mispronounce this, but Bananastasia asked how to create a safe environment for both baby and dog, introducing boundaries, signs of love versus stress. Um, so this is, as I mentioned before, uh, place command is uh, probably gonna be um, abused, used and abused, because it's a, it gives us the ability to keep our dog in an ex, under control for an extended period of time while giving the dog some options. So Lexi here is in place. I have her collar on and everything because, you know, we're doing the video. I don't want her to move, but she doesn't need it because it's a controlled environment. But, you know, she's been laying here for probably, I think I'm talking about half an hour now. And when you have extended place um, upwards of, you know, four to six hours or whatever it is, like whatever length of time that you're needing, it really takes off a lot of weight, okay? Um, I always tell my clients like, when you're running around with the baby, you know, having to, to pump milk, having to prepare milk, having to burp the baby, change the diaper, uh, walk around, rock them, uh, you know, try to get a nap in. Like when you got all these things going on, the last thing you want to worry about is what is my dog doing? Um, and uh, what is my dog doing? And um, uh, I have all these things on my plate with the baby, right? So if you place your dog and it's like, okay, I have to spend the next two hours place uh, taking care of the baby, you're not worried about your dog. Okay, it's like just one thing off the plate. Uh, but when your dog's walking around, maybe they're in between your legs, you don't want to trip over them, stuff like that. Um, place command is the best way to, in my opinion, create a safe environment. Uh, don't worry about, oh, my dog's on place eight hours a day. Dogs sleep 16 to 20 hours a day. Uh, you're just picking where they do it for a part of that day, okay? Uh, place is also more lenient, right? The dog can sit, stand, lay down. She has a perimeter here, so if she decides she wants to readjust, it's perfectly fine. Um, so that's why we, I, I, I suggest place. You can also technically use the word down. The down command, however, is much more strict. Um, the dog cannot break that position of down. They cannot sit, they cannot stand. So it makes it a bit more difficult for you as the, oh, as the, as the parent to try to keep tabs on, is my dog still in that very strict down and taking care of your baby at the same time, okay? I already mentioned earlier about the boundaries. Uh, using your remote collar, if you've done remote collar training to set boundaries around the baby's scent, uh, if the dog gets too close, simply give a tap on the collar. The do it'll deviate the dog. It will not create a negative association between the dog and the baby. The dog just goes, when I get too close, I got I get a little nip. I need to respect that space. Dogs do this with each other. Going back to the example I gave with my friend, uh, my friend's dad when I was a kid, um, you know, his, his chow, his female chow had a litter. He went in to go check on the litter. She bit him in the hand. Okay. And he didn't take it personally. He's just like, you know, I got too close and, you know, her maternal instinct kicked in. I got bit. This is what it is. So his dog was an aggressive. Um, he understood that communication. So she set a boundary of, yeah, I've known you for years, but these are my puppies and you're not gonna endanger them, get away, okay? So you can use the, you can absolutely use the same uh, tactics with your dog and your baby. Um, because remember, things can happen even when they're very close. As I, the example I gave earlier, where the dog started sniffing the baby, dog became unsure, growled, and then nipped the baby in the, uh, in the face. Um, uh, so that's a good way to avoid it. Uh, signs of the love versus stress. Uh, it, I would say signs of like relaxation versus stress, really, okay? Because um, people are like, oh, my dog is licking my baby on the face. Well, one, I wouldn't allow that because again, too close. Also, you don't know if your dog just finished licking their butt. Do you really want your dog licking their butt and then going and licking your, your baby's face? Like bacteria, we don't want that, okay? So um, if your dog, let's say Lexi is here, I were to have a baby and she's in a relaxed state, like this is good. The dog is tying together. I can be in a relaxed, passive state while the baby is in my space, okay? And there, when I talk about the boundary, uh, just to clarify, I'm talking about like a loose boundary because this confuses people. They're like, well, what if my dog is, you know, sleeping on the couch and I want to sit down with the baby, but I don't want the dog to move. I go, that's fine. 
because the ba you're there is the buffer. You're there is the protector, right? So if if I was on the couch at Lex and I sat down and I you know had the baby here, if she came over, I can set the boundary either through correcting her and or using my arm to keep space, uh, or correcting the collar if needed, because I'm here with the baby, and so we're breaking that that uh, that six foot boundary. But the dogs are very good about contacts. And the dogs are like, okay, when I'm loose and walking around, I gotta respect that space. But sometimes the baby may enter into my space, but everything is fine. I don't need to feel like I have to leave, okay? So I, it's really more signs of relaxation than it is signs of love versus stress. A signs of stress would be lip licking, avoidant behavior. Like, so if the baby's coming close, and let's, let's say um, the dog is laying down, you might see the dog do this. And like side eye, the dog's giving avoidance. Right, so if I keep pressing, I expect something to happen here because the dog's already saying, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this, okay? Uh, lip licking just says, uh, I'm stressed about what's happening right now. Uh, growling, uh, you know, barking, you know, obviously the more obvious things. Uh, and then you wanna keep an eye on when does this trigger? So like, let's say the dog is sleeping on the couch or is on the couch in a resting state. I uh, bring the baby over and as I'm approaching with the baby, you might see the dog kind of start to scooch away and then when I sit down, they might jump off the couch and walk away. That is a very obvious sign of the dog does not like the baby or the presence of the baby, okay? But they did avoidance behavior. They said, I'm gonna leave the situation I'm uncomfortable with. That is fine. Uh, a not fine example would be a case that I had many years ago. Uh, it, was a, it was a Shih Tzu. Uh, dog's name was Crasher. And um, it was, I, I think it was already kind of nervous of people um, and kids. And then they had, a, they, you know, they got pregnant, they had a baby. And I remember telling them, uh, you know, when your baby starts to crawl and stuff and be more mobile, don't allow your baby to corner your dog because your dog's going to bite them. Okay. Fast forward a bit. I actually ran into the dad uh, at Burnham Harbor. Uh, I used to work on boats at the beginning of my career uh, while I was building my business. And uh, coincidentally, he had a boat a few slips away from where, where the, the, the boats I worked on. Um, and I was like, oh, hey, I was like, how's that, you know, how's things, how's things with the baby? And they're like, and how's Crasher? And he's like, oh, yeah, Crasher's with my, with our, my in-laws. And I was like, why? And I, and I, I pretty much knew. And he's like, well, uh, you know, the baby got climbed up on the couch. It was exactly as you said, the baby climbed up on the couch, started crawling towards Crasher. Crasher was doing really well. He wasn't running away or anything. And then the baby got close and went to pet him. And then he bit the baby in the face. Okay. And I looked at him and he said, I know our fault but we figured it's probably best that we just give Crasher to our in-laws until our child is older, okay? So in my opinion, the dog is not at fault there. That is the parent's fault. Um, what they should have done is redirected the baby, picked up the baby, put it back on the floor, and or took Crasher and put him, they had, uh, they had like a, a basement, a first floor and a second floor, if I remember, put the dog in the basement, close the door, put the dog upstairs, close the door, put the dog in the kennel, in a room, close the door, but don't allow the baby to do that, okay? Because, and that's not aggression, that's a correction, okay? This is very important that we understand that because uh, people will mis, um, how to say, mislabel the behavior and then ultimately the dog ends up paying for it, okay? So yeah, lip licking, nervous movement, uh, signs of, would be signs of stress, uh, moving away from the baby, sign of stress, um, growling, obviously, baring teeth, all, all the pretty obvious stuff. Um, Moving towards the baby, if they're being very cautious or if the baby, baby moves and you see them kind of skittishly move away, clearly a sign of stress or kind of a sign of the discomfort, okay? Uh, relaxation would be soft eyes, completely neutral, like not caring. Like you can see Lex here, she's just in a complete resting state, just kind of like this, right? She's not like this rigid or anything like that. Like if she was like this, then that would tell me she's uncomfortable with the environment. Excessive panting salivating, well eye, stuff like that would be signs of stress. Uh, Zoe Bear comment, or the Zoe Bear commented, uh, honestly, the best advice Canine Perspective gave us, nail a solid place, game changer when you have a little one as an infant and they evolve to being a wild toddler. Thank you, Zoe. Um, uh, we miss her, uh, we miss you guys. Uh, we'll, I hope California is treating you well. So, uh, but yeah, great job on, on utilizing and reinforcing place. Uh, and as I had mentioned earlier, place is like your best friend when you have a child uh, uh, and you're, you're running around taking care of them, you know, in the beginning. And then of course, when they're running around and you're having to keep an eye on them. Okay. So not, so 
Uh, dogs have a learning capacity of a two to three year old child, so essentially a terrible twos toddler. So when you have a baby that's growing and is also in their terrible twos and you have your dog that is essentially always in their terrible twos, now you have two kids to worry about, right? So having your place command takes off one of those responsibilities. Um, but good job guys for reinforcing the training and then um, uh, if you ever visit, come say hi. Uh, two, two dogs, one Kong had actually emailed me. Um, again, congrats on the baby, congrats on baby Tobias. Um, and then theirs was a, a, regarding a vehicle, which admittedly is outside of my scope of knowledge just because I'm not a car person. Um, but they asked, I feel like Teddy might be indifferent, not, but not sure how much I will react. I do plan to board them for a few days. I'll be in the hospital, which already happened. Uh, but wondering on practical tips that we might be able to do over the next seven weeks to help them transition to having a new baby in the house. Okay. So. One would be, you know, they've already done training with me before, you know, utilize that place, reinforce it, um, keep as best you can the structure that you've learned from your training. Uh, obviously, you guys did your training a few years ago, so you're way ahead of the game. Um, walks are a great way to build a relationship between the baby and the dog because it's an activity. Okay. Uh, walking in general with your dog is, is a great way to build a relationship. So like if I get clients whose dogs may not like their significant other, I'll tell them, you know, let's work with their significant other on how to do the remote collar training and have them be a part of the walk. So actually have the significant other lead the walk. Okay. Have the dog with the remote collar, set the boundaries and stuff like that. So the dog goes, okay, I also have to respect you. And with respect and time, the dog will open up to them. Okay. And accept them as a family member. Uh, it doesn't always happen. There are no guarantees here, but it's much more likely to happen when we have some kind of relationship building exercise and exercise and walking is great. Okay. So, um, don't worry in the beginning, if you don't have time to do extended walks with the dogs, or you can't do walks with the baby and the dogs. Okay. Place again, is you're going to be your best friend. Um, don't worry about placing your dogs too much. Um, there's no such thing in my book. Dogs won't really understand the concept of time and stuff, but essentially it's just taking off that stressor of what my dog's doing and what we need to do with the baby. Um, and in time, as you feel like things are kind of uh, settling down, you're getting more into a routine, uh, stuff like that. You can start to be a little bit more lenient on the place and not maybe use it so much, but do always remember to set the boundaries. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. It's pretty much it. You know, just keep the structure that you have as best you can reinforce and use place. And then when possible, you know, do family pack walks together. Okay. Okay. Great way to, great way to uh, build that, that relationship there. Uh, Zuri, the pit bull right now, it's easiest to honor Zuri space when the babies aren't mobile. What are some practices we can do to keep everybody, everyone comfortable with one another once the babies are mobile? Guess what I'm going to say, guys, <laughs> place command, right? Place command. But then also you want to be realistic. Okay, so I had a case uh, that the dog was not doing very well with the baby. They had thankfully listened to my instruction of muzzle conditioning the dog and having the dog muzzled. And they did allow the baby a little too close to the dog and the dog tried to correct the baby. Thankfully, the muzzle was on. Nothing happened past the bruise. Okay, so uh, what I because we, we did an in home. What we, uh, what I told them was you have to be realistic and think to yourself, my baby's going to be crawling. I'm tired. I don't want to worry about the dog and the baby. So I take the dog and I put them in a different room. I take the dog and I put them in a crate in a different room. I don't recommend putting the dog in a crate within the same room because if the baby is crawling and I'm not really a big fan of dogs being loose in a room that's closed off that the baby has access to. Meaning if the baby is, if the dog is created in the same room as the baby, when they're crawling and the baby crawls to the kennel and can slip their fingers into the kennel, into the crate, something's going to happen. If the dog is in an adjacent room with the door closed and the baby crawls and starts to poke their hand underneath the door, something can happen. So I'm a bigger fan of having the dog put away in a separate room that's not accessible to the baby and or crated in a room that might be adjacent to the, or the room that we're in. So we got, uh, we're, we got the room we're in, door closed, dogs in the kennel, 
in the room with the door closed because the baby has access to get their fingers underneath there, okay? So don't feel bad for your dog. Your dog does not care. If your dog does care, again, then you should have done all this crate training and stuff prior to the baby being born. Uh, otherwise, we need to address that problem. Um, so you wanna be realistic. If it's okay, I can keep an eye on my dog and I can keep an eye on my baby. Like, like I had a good night's rest, stuff like that, and I don't wanna crate my dog, what have you. Great, that's fine. Your dog is placed, they're across the room, baby is crawling around. And remember that six foot minimum buffer, right? So if the baby starts to go, oh, what's over there in the corner and starts to crawl, be prepared to get up, pick the baby up, move them to the other side of the room and sit back down again, okay? And then five minutes later, be ready to pick the baby up and do it again, okay? You're gonna keep repeating that process a million times if you have to, because your child at this age does not understand the consequence, right? Or, or a consequence, so to speak, um, if you're trying to apply one. Uh, so it's, if you're trying to have the best of both worlds where it's like, I don't want to have my dog put away, but my dog's going to be in place, but at the same time, I want my baby to crawl. You have to accept the fact that it's going to come with a bit of work in the sense that you have to pick up the baby, redirect them over and over again. Okay. So, uh, if you don't want to do that, you could put up a, a, a boundary, like a, a baby gate or something. Um, so you have to have some, some kind of buffer, but you do want to be realistic about what you're willing to do in the particular context, okay? Um, and then if it's like, okay, uh, my baby is sleeping, now I'm gonna give my dog free time. Right, yeah, it makes sense, right? I'm gonna have my dog be loose because my baby's in the crib sleeping. Yeah, it makes sense, now your dog is loose, right? If you happen to have a dog that's maybe not a big fan of the baby. So um, uh, control, boundaries, uh, separation, uh, all that stuff is good. Um, think here. Distance is good just because it allows the dog to, again, observe the baby, coexist with the baby and go like, what are you about? Uh, you know, you went from immobile to crawling to now you're kind of stumbling around. Oh, stuff like that. Uh, excuse me. If you cannot have eyes on both, <coughs> put the dog away, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, just reading, make sure I don't... Um, Forget anything, so what are some practices we can do to keep your phone with one another? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the best approach, okay? I don't recommend giving your dog an object or a toy or, or a bone uh, to chew on while they're on place when the baby is crawling because it might heighten them in terms of resource guarding because since they are on place, they don't have a lot of options. They understand that, you know, flight is not available to them because remember, place means go to this object and don't get off. So then if the dog feels trapped and the baby is crawling towards them and they have an object, I could see that the dog escalating a bit more quickly uh, because they feel contained, they feel confined. They don't have the option to escape because they're under command, okay? Uh, it's an arty party. Best advice for the intro and making sure Artie feels like he's not being ignored or kicked out, but also has good and safe boundaries being present and or involved, okay? So you don't have to worry about the dog being ignored or kicked out because dogs don't think that way, okay? Uh, it's very common. Uh, actually, going back to the example that I gave earlier of the dog that you know tried the uh, that attempted to to nip the baby on the on the on the face on the head, but was muzzled. Uh, they were they were feeling really bad because they had, had this dog for years, and now the dog is t essentially you know second place because now their baby is born. They go yes, that is correct because your baby comes first, uh, dog comes second. But I told them the dog doesn't think like man like you know big brother is here and. You know, things have changed. You don't love me as much. You don't take me out. Like, dogs don't think that way. That's the human emotional uh, being applied to the situation. Okay? Dogs don't think that way. Um, it's you putting on the emotion, so you can let that part go. Uh, but also has good and safe boundaries being present slash involved. Okay? Again, just going, going to um, uh, place command and or the distance stuff. Now, uh, Artie, from what I remember, you know, social guy, um, is my recommendation is always distance and boundaries. Um, however, you know your dog better than I do. You're in the situation. You're actually, see, you're actually seeing the interaction, right? Is I'm very cautious just because of the things that I've seen throughout 12 years of training dogs, okay? So I would, my approach is to be avoidant and cautious so I don't even risk seeing the problem, okay? Because once the interaction has happened, there is no going back, right? So for the child, 
if the child is bitten and then has that negative associate, like it's already happened. The dog is, the kid is already freaked out about dogs now, okay? And I have heard of kids being bitten and not being freaked out about dogs. You know, again, every, every being is different. Our, our genetic, genetic makeup is different, but you don't know until it actually has happened, okay? So I'm, I'm very cautious with this kind of stuff. So if you know Artie, is, is, he's, he's relaxed, he's actually pretty good around kids, he might be a little bit avoidant, but he's not like freaking out and stuff, then he's clearly more comfortable, right? Is feel free again to apply positive reinforcement uh, during the coexistence. Uh, if the child is able to extend and give treats, and uh, I have videos that I'm gonna be reviewing and assessing, like how is this interaction, stuff like that. Uh, Elizabeth posted a great one with Summer because um, uh, Luna is a nervous dog and her interaction with, uh, with uh, Summer was great. But it's because, you know, Summer's already understanding directions like slow and be nice and there was positive reinforcement involved. She was taking, uh, Luna was very gently taking treats from Summer. Uh, we also want to factor that in. Does your dog take treats gently? So. The dog taking treats from the from the child is great because now that association is created with that child. But if your dog has bad manners with taking treats, I don't recommend it because the child's going, you know, they're, they're going to do this most likely. Okay, they're going to extend the treat like this and the dog's going to go chump, right, trying to get the treat and the kid's going to freak out. Now, that's not aggression. That's just bad manners. But the child does not, interp not interpret it that way. Okay. So... Um, if you've taught your dog how to take things gently, that's great. Otherwise, we would want to teach the child how to, how to give a treat, which is always open palm. Treat right there, just like this. So the dog can lick it off. The reason why dogs chomp at this is because of the way it's being offered. So when we train our puppies, people usually give the treats like this, and they get, they get mad because the puppy is biting their hand. So I go, don't do that. Do this. So now the puppy has, and even if they try, the puppy tries to bite, their mouth hits the back of the hand, all right, the front of the mouth, so it prevents uh, them really biting. Plus, here you don't have loose skin like you would here. So very rare that the dog would actually make contact with you. They just take the treat. Otherwise, most dogs tend, or puppies tend to also just lick the treat out of your, um, out of your hand there. So um, no high-pitched energy because now you're calling, causing stimulation because people tend to say, oh, my, you know, it's the baby. Come say hi to the baby. And it escalates the brain, and an already stimulated or escalated brain is much more likely to um, uh, fall into uh, uh, or, 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 or trickle into um, aggressiveness, defensiveness, stress, because the dog's already kind of getting worked up. Okay, so always nice and passive, be nice, be gentle. Uh, I always use uh, assertive tones. Like, I don't really want to soften my energy because I always want like the dog to understand I am in control of the situation. Um, so, you know, be nice, you know, I'm, I'm still saying be nice, but I'm still saying it assertively. Okay. Um, uh, but also good at inside boundaries. Um, yeah, just, you know, really see how Artie feels about the child. And if he looks calm and relaxed, maybe a little bit apprehensive, uh, but you're like, oh, this is, you know, he, he, he's not, he's not freaking out or anything. Just like gradual introduction. Um, uh, even if it's like you're holding the baby and like Artie's on his dog bed over there, he's still in the social context. He's still within the space, okay? The dog does not have to be physically touching, uh, uh, being talked to or anything like, like that to be involved in the social context. Simply being in the room, like this here, is actually social context, right? So if I had a, a baby or child or a puppy or something and, 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 and we're hanging out, this is social context. You know, Lexi would be aware dad has a child in his hands, and I'm here laying down, relaxing, minding my business, okay? So I hope that answers your questions. I have a few more that I got from emails, so what I'm gonna do now is, uh, you know, I'm gonna cap the video here before it goes too long, chop it up so that we have, you know, places where I answer the questions, uh, but then I'm gonna do a, uh, a playlist of just like questions that I've gotten throughout the years, uh, reviewing cases that I've worked with throughout the years, um, uh, giving examples and stuff like that, you know, just to kind of, if anything pertains to you, that'll be much more easier to find than trying to answer, you know, these, all these questions uh, that are fairly in depth. Okay. So to summarize things, one, uh, don't feel bad if your dog is growling, don't freak out. Uh, it's normal. Um, 
set boundaries. Don't allow the dog too close to your child. Everything is about time. Don't rush things. Don't present your baby to the dog, to the dog like Simba. Because people, I've seen people do that. Don't do that. Um, don't push your dog liking the baby. Don't push that. If it's going to happen, it'll happen over time. People get caught up in wanting that perfect family picture, and that's where they put themselves in the position for something to happen, and it's not worth, the risk is not worth the reward, okay? Um, and then, you know, be ahead of the game. Start the training right away. As soon as you know you, we want to have a baby or and all that stuff, get your training done. Again, I don't care how you train your dog, but uh, start the process and be realistic. You know, if it's not working, move on to another trainer. If it's not working, move on to another trainer. Uh, in my book, aversives are always going to be a part of training, no matter how social and friendly your dog is. But at the end of the day, it is your dog. Okay. So that concludes this video. Uh, thank you guys for watching. And like I said in the beginning, please feel free to submit your questions. I'm going to make this an actual kind of series, and um, uh, hope to provide more uh, hope to provide more information for you guys. Right. Thanks for watching. I'm Jesse with Camp Perspective. Yes.